Welcome to Muscle Tissue Part 3, Basics of Muscle Contraction. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, and I'm the Histology Wizard. Today's tutorial will cover muscle contraction comparing skeletal muscle and smooth muscle contraction. We won't cover cardiac muscle contraction today. Before we get into the details about skeletal and smooth muscle contraction, let's cover the very basics of contraction. So all muscle cells contract by a sliding filament mechanism that involves interactions between actin or thin filaments, shown here in red, and myosin, or those thick filaments, shown here in green. These interactions are driven by increasing calcium levels and ATPase activity, but the activation mechanism differs between striated and smooth muscle. So we'll begin with control of skeletal muscle contraction. In this cartoon, we see the assembled thin filament that is actin with its associated proteins. And these proteins include tropomyosin, which is seen here in yellow, kind of wrapping around actin. We also see troponin, which is this protein that has three subunits that binds both calcium and tropomyosin. Now, when calcium levels are low in the cell, troponin and tropomyosin together are going to block the myosin binding site on actin. And it's really the availability or the regulation of the availability of this binding site that drives striated muscle contraction. In skeletal muscle, contraction is regulated by calcium modulation of that troponin-tropomyosin complex. And in this cartoon, you can see again that yellow tropomyosin and the blue troponin complex. So when calcium levels rise, troponin C binds to calcium. That causes a conformational change that shifts tropomyosin kind of downward. And this action exposes that myosin binding site on the actin. The head of the myosin chains can now sort of swing and bind actin. Then actin helps activate this myosin ATPase, which is going to accelerate head movements that produce that sliding motion, allowing myosin to sort of walk along the actin towards, in fact, the plus ends of actin. What does it really mean to say that myosin walks? Well, this diagram goes into a bit more detail about cross-bridge cycling, so that process of myosin kind of walking along the actin filament. So we know that myosin functions as an ATPase, and it utilizes ATP to produce a molecular conformational change of the myosin itself, and this produces movement. Movement of the filaments over each other then happens when those globular heads protruding from the myosin filaments attach and interact with the actin filaments, and that's what we call sort of the cross bridge state, forming those cross bridges. The myosin heads tilt and sort of drag along the actin filament a short distance. That's what we call the power stroke. Once ADP is released, the myosin head remains attached to actin until ATP is going to bind to the myosin head which causes another conformational change that decreases myosin's affinity for actin, and so it releases. As the cleft in myosin closes around ATP, ATP hydrolyzes, and this causes another conformational change. And you can really see in this diagram that the myosin head changes its angle, allowing it to relocate to another site on the actin filament that's a little further away, that is more towards the plus end. So now we have that cross bridge forming with the myosin head in a new position on the actin, the phosphate is released, and the cycle continues. So this process is called cross-bridge cycling, and it's the same for all muscles. So we're now going to briefly review the structure of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the regulation of calcium uptake and release. So recall that that sarcoplasmic reticulum is that network that surrounds the myofibrils, and it releases and sequesters calcium. And when the muscle cell is depolarized, that depolarization signal is conducted by the T-tubules. So remember, those are the extensions of the sarcolemma penetrate deep into the fiber in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now that depolarization signal is going to signal to the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that stored calcium. And again, it's that rise in calcium that allows it to bind to troponin, exposing that myosin binding site on actin. So this is our brief overview of skeletal muscle contraction, but if you want more details on the physiology, I suggest you read more in your Guyton and Hall Medical Physiology textbook. We're now going to switch and briefly look at muscle contraction in smooth muscle. So first I'm going to give you an overview. I'll highlight the differences between striated and smooth muscle, and then we'll walk through the process. So again, smooth muscle contains those actin and myosin filaments, but they are not organized in sarcomeres. Instead, smooth muscle contains so-called dense bodies. These contain alpha actinin, just like a Z-disc, and they function similar to the Z-disc. Now, there's no troponin in smooth muscle cells, but they have tropomyosin, which still binds to and stabilizes actin. Instead of troponin, there's a protein called calmodulin, which binds calcium in the cytosol of the smooth muscle cell and activates myosin light chain kinase. 
and it's myosin light chain kinase that's responsible for the sensitivity of the contractile fibers and smooth muscle. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Calcium ions that initiate the contraction come from outside the cell. This is different than skeletal muscle. There's a still a some amount of calcium that does come from this sarcoplasmic reticulum, but the bulk of it comes from outside the cell. And this is also true for cardiac muscle. So here's a cartoon that shows the steps in smooth muscle contraction. So let's walk through them together. First, we have an increase in cytoplasmic calcium. And that calcium binds to calmodulin and activates calmodulin. Then activated calmodulin activates myosin light chain kinase by binding to it. Now remember that the cross bridge cycling can't occur until those myosin heads have been activated to allow the cross bridges to form. And in the case of smooth muscle, the myosin light chain kinase is going to phosphorylate myosin. Now as in skeletal muscle, the myosin still acts as an ATPA, so it's going to use that ATP to produce molecular conformational change and produce movement, so it's going to force that cross bridge toward the thin filament. The completion of the cross bridge cycle drives the contraction and then as calcium levels drop, myosin light chain phosphatase is going to dephosphorylate myosin. That's going to dissociate the actin myosin binding and return that cross bridge to its position closer to myosin. So here's just a little bit more detail on the activity of that myosin light chain kinase, showing the inactive state with the unphosphorylated light chains, and you can see that the tails are kind of coiled up. The conformational change is induced by the activity of the kinase. So it's going to phosphorylate those light chains, which allows the myosin tail to be released. So now the heads are activated and the cross bridge cycling can occur. And it's important to just reiterate here that because of the phosphorylation of myosin greatly increases its ATPase activity, in smooth muscle this means that it's the thick filament that ultimately controls contraction. Again, this is in contrast to skeletal or striated muscle where the ATPase activity of myosin is always high so that again, it's myosin access to the thin filament that controls the contraction. So that's really the basics of control of contraction and cross bridge cycling in smooth muscle. But how exactly does this cause the cell to contract because there's no sarcomeres? As I mentioned before, there aren't any sarcomeres. Instead, the thin filaments are going to attach to the dense bodies, seen here in the EM picture on the left. And these bodies act like Z-discs and they contain alpha actinin. Now you can see in this cartoon on the top showing relaxed muscles that those actin filaments are going to attach to the dense bodies and they stretch from one to another. And in contraction, the filaments are actually going to pull on the dense bodies, which shortens the fiber. And this explains why the nucleus often is shaped like a corkscrew. So this cartoon shows the steps of contraction in a slightly different way and in adding in the attachment of the actin filaments to the dense bodies. So you can see because they're connected to one another, they almost form this kind of X shape as they stretch from one another. With the influx of calcium, myosin is activated, myosin light chain kinase is activated, then myosin is activated, and the actin slides past the myosin filaments and it really shortens that X as you can see in this drawing. This is going to pull on the dense bodies, contract the cell, and it actually sort of squeezes the cell so that the nucleus is actually distorting. What signals activate smooth muscle contraction? So we know that smooth muscle fibers contract and relax in response to a number of different signals. These include action potentials from the autonomic nervous system, stretching from food contents in the gut, hormones both in the gut and in other tissues, to changes in the oxygen levels of the tissues. Now, unlike skeletal muscle, there's no specialized connection between the nerve fiber and the smooth muscle cell, so there's no neuromuscular junction. If we look at this cartoon of smooth muscle, you can see one axon of a postganglionic autonomic neuron, and it actually passes kind of close to the muscle cells, close being relative, and has a number of these swellings in the fibers called varicosities. And these varicosities release neurotransmitter. And unlike skeletal muscle cells, there are a variety of different neurotransmitters that are released from these varicosities, so not just acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter released from the varicosity has a much longer distance to travel than the acetylcholine released at the neuromuscular junction. So this is another way that the control or the timing of a smooth muscle contraction is different from that very quick response of a skeletal muscle. In addition, the neurotransmitter can bind to any one of nearby smooth muscle cells and this gives the smooth muscle cell a flexibility not found in the neuromuscular junction. So we'll end our brief discussion of contraction here. Thanks for stopping by.